hi. Really nice to see you all. The other thing is we're live streaming, so I'm going to say hi to everybody who's watching it in the States or wherever you are. Um, please tweet. Uh, you can tweet to at lspace10 and use hashtag HowlRound. And if in the audience you're too shy to actually ask any questions, uh, we have an after-show talk back with Helen Benedict, the playwright, and with Mark Evans, who's an ex-soldier who was in Afghanistan, and he's written a book called Code Black, uh, of his experiences in Afghanistan and his experiences afterwards. Um, there is an interval of 50, uh, 15 minutes after the first, uh, first bit, and then um, do fill in your feedback forms, love to hear what you think, and um, I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you very much for coming. because my mom was a junkie and we were always being evicted. But we really loved each other. Maria, ven pa casa! She was Mexican, but she looked white like me. We were so alike. We were like sisters. Then, when I was 16, Grammy got cancer. And the day before my 17th birthday, she died. I knew that she was sick, but you just never really expect it, you know? My grandpa didn't really know what to do with me after that. He made me feel like he wasn't really my grandpa anymore. So I joined a graffiti crew. And I got kicked out of school and another. My boyfriend lived across the street from my school, so I used to go and see him instead of going to class. I was smoking a lot of weed, really messing up. But in the end, I got sick and tired of myself, and that's when I started thinking about the army. There were recruiters in the hallways all the time at school, so I went to see one. If you sign up with the National Guard, you won't have to serve outside the country. National, because that means in the country, right? You get 3,000 bucks just for enlisting. The Army will pay for college, train you in whatever job you want, and you get to travel. And all I had to do was sign up for six years. I always wanted to do something I was proud of. I imagined telling my grandchildren about something that I'd done to protect the country. It was the year after 9-11. I think a lot of people felt that way. So I went to a recruiter and said I wanted to sign up. You're going to have to get your mom to sign that because you're only 17. I hadn't seen my mom in months. But I called her and I told her. If you want to join, forge my name. I don't care. So I forged her name. Right there, under the recruiter's nose. We do it all the time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, I got my $3,000, but it turns out it's spread out over four years. <laughs> and they take the taxes out. The Army never paid for me to go to any college that I wanted to go to. And it turns out you can't sign up for six years. It's got to be eight. So I'm in until I'm like 24. And I never got to travel anywhere. Well, apart from the war in Iraq. My whole time in Iraq was a daze. I worked nights, and we were shot at every night. Mortars were coming in, and mortars is death. And you know, when they say that only men are allowed on the front line, it's the biggest crock of shit. I was a tank gunner. But when I say that I was in the war, Nobody listens. Nobody believes that I was a soldier. And do you know why? Because I'm female.
Blessed are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. When I was a freshman in high school, I vowed I'd never be in the army. I wanted to go to college, you know? But my parents are real religious. Clara, you don't need to go to college. You can do God's work better in the army. It's strange, because <coughs> me and my dad went to college, but they told me I didn't need to go. I was working as a cook in Bible camp in the summers, and I saw how I could make kids happy doing that, so I thought maybe Mama was right. Maybe serving food in the army would give me a mission to spread the word of God. So she took me to the recruitment office. I was just 16 then. They gave me the test that shows what kind of jobs you can do in the military. My score suggested that I could be a nurse. I wasn't sure about that. All I'd ever wanted to be was a teacher. But then the recruiter started calling my house all the time. And one day this recruiter came to my home. He was three years older than me. This model picture guy, you know, blonde, blue eyed, so handsome in his uniform. He told me I could be a chaplain's assistant. And that appealed to me because it was religious. And he was one of those perfect guys, you know. So I joined the reserves. Mama signed the waiver because I wasn't 17 yet. It was 2004 by then, but Mama and me weren't worried about the war. We knew you could die just as easily crossing the street. It's all in God's plan when you die, whether you go to war or not. Name is Terrace, Sergeant DeWalt Johnson to you. I'm 37 years old and the mother of four kids, two boys, two girls. My home is in Georgia now, but I grew up in D.C. My life there was pretty drastic. My stepfather was a drunk, beat up on my mom all the time. Beat up on me and my brothers and sisters too, but he saved the worst of it for her. He hit her with a hammer, lacerated her legs, broke her skull. One time, he stabbed her 13 times with a long kitchen knife. Till the knife sank in so deep, he couldn't pull it back out again. She only survived because she was so fat. <laughs> By the time I was 13, I learned to fight him back. Laid him out flat with a baseball bat once. It was, I've got to kill this guy or he is going to kill my mom. As soon as I could, I moved out and started living with my boyfriend. He's my husband now. A gentleman and a sweetheart. I've known him since I was nine. By the time I was 19, though, we had two kids and I was working two jobs. One at McDonald's and the other selling tour tickets down at Union Station. One day, this recruiter comes up to me. Have you ever thought about signing up? The Army will pay for college, train you in whatever job you want, and you get to travel. I got interested because I'd always wanted to travel. So I joined the Army Reserves, and that enabled us to get out of D.C. <laughs> D.C. is such a poison place to me. All you got there is a bunch of drugs and killing. Three of my brothers were shot to death there for no reason. My son was shot in the feet in a drive-by when he was just five years old, playing in the yard. It's because of the military that my four kids live like they do now. We have a nice house, they go to good schools. So I liked being in the army. Then they sent me to Iraq. I grew up in a small rural town in Wisconsin. It's only about 2,000 people, so pretty much everybody knows everybody. There were two types of people in my town, the people who stayed and the people who left. My way of getting out was to join the Army National Guard when I was 17. A lot of people from my high school were in the military, so it didn't seem like any big deal. But my parents weren't happy about it. I come from a very political household. My dad was an elected official and we're Democrats, so I had to really argue with them to get them to sign and let me join. Anna, we just want to make sure you know what you're getting into. But I was stubborn. I thought I wanted to give something back to society, do something for my country, but really, it was a rebellion. When I joined the military, I got an overwhelmingly good response from my community. If I went downtown or to the supermarket in my uniform, people were proud of me. It made me feel like I belonged. After all, it was pre-9-11. We all thought differently then. In August 2001, I shipped out to do my training at Fort Jackson, and zero day, the day you meet your drill instructor, turned out to be September 11th. We just finished taking the oath when the sergeant said something about a plane hitting towers, but I couldn't really hear. People were running to the barracks, getting hysterical. The sergeant was saying, We're going to war! We're going to war! We're going to war! But 
I just thought it was part of the training. It took me a couple hours to realize it was real. After that, there were rumors that training would speed up and we'd be sent over. But it didn't happen. Training just went on as normal. We stuck bayonets into non-shaped targets, sang songs about blood and killing, and didn't bat an eye, because we were already desensitized. Air Force. My grandfather and father were Air Force officers, and well, all my life I wanted to be just like them. So I joined the Air Force Reserves after high school and put myself through school during my enlistment. I got married too and had a baby girl. My daughter was only two years old when I was deployed. That was March 2003, right as the U.S. was going into Iraq. I had to leave her with my husband. We're divorced now. It was so hard to leave my little girl. I kept worrying about would she be fit or right, would she be able to sleep okay. It really hurt to hear her little voice on the phone. Well, I was on active duty for a little over eight years in the Air Force. I was a public affairs specialist, that means combat correspondent, and a photographer. I loved my job. I am Santiago Flores, 46 years old, and retired after 22 years in the Army. I was a drill sergeant who taught other people how to be drill sergeants. So, I have a drill sergeant personality. <laughs> used to tell my soldiers, I don't give a damn if you don't like me. I am not here to be your friend. You have an idea? You think it'll work? I'm open to that. <laughs> but you have Master Sergeant Flores. Yes, Sergeant! Joining the military is not unusual for Native Americans. It's our way of holding on to the idea of being a warrior, of being a, a provider and a protector. It's something we find great honor and pride in. And nowadays, it is hard to find things that bring honor to your family for Natives. Until I was 10, we never lived in one place long enough for me to finish out of grade school. My dad kept moving to find one job or another, but also because he was trying to run away from his drinking. You know, drinking's a problem for Native people. Well, it was no different for my family. Finally, he bought a house and we stayed put. My dad's a supervisor in a bakery. My mom's a bank teller. They raised me in a little town in southern Wisconsin. I didn't have any direction after high school, so I joined the Army Military Police, became Specialist Sylvia Gonzalez. I did it for the money and the challenge and the discipline. My parents didn't have any opinion on me enlisting. If that's what I wanted to do, it was fine with them. So mom signed the papers because I was only 17. And then 9-11 happened and I was mobilized to Iraq. 9-11 made a lot of people proud of being in military including me. I, I wasn't scared. I was glad that I was in an organization that was going to do something about this. I never really thought about the actual war in Iraq at first. It really wasn't my place to get involved in something that I didn't know about. The thing that worried me was that I was going to be away from home for a whole year. They sent me notice three weeks before I had to leave. My parents don't deal with things emotionally, so... I just figured out my stuff, and I left. When I was 13, my dad brings home this white guy to work for him fixing cars, George. This was 1973, and George was just back from Vietnam. He had one leg shorter than the other, and he spent a whole year in hospital with his wounds. And people said he'd raped girls in Vietnam. I didn't like him at all. But he started being nice to me, took me to a drive-in movie, gave me a joint to smoke and something to drink, 
And then he raped me. And I got pregnant from that rape. My dad was furious. Thought it was all my fault. Didn't care that I was only 13. So he makes me get in the car and we go looking for George. We find him pretty quick. Get in the fucking car, my dad said. He was six feet tall and people did what he said. So George gets in, dad drives us back to the house, sits us down at the kitchen table, pulls out a gun, sets it on the table in front of us, and he tells George, you have five minutes and two choices. Either marry my daughter or die. And all I could think was, if my dad shoots George, he's going to go to prison. Then all of us are going to be without a dad. My mom's going to be without a husband. It'll all be my fault. So I told George to marry him. I really hated him. My eldest son is the product of that rape. I, I love him, but he knows the story, and he feels pretty alienated from my family. And he hates having an Indian mom because he sees no honor in that. For the next few years, I'm living with George. He is beating the crap out of me, and I'm turning to drink just like the rest of my family. And when I'm 16, I get pregnant again. Birth control? Nobody told me about that. And I've had so much trauma in my life, who would have thought about that anyway? Finally, at one point, I just can't take it anymore. So I decide to kill George and dump him in Lake Tahoe. But he's such a big guy, I can't figure out how I'm going to get his body there. I'm going to have to put him on the boat alive and then kill him, and he's a really strong guy. So I'm thinking, OK, that's not going to work. But by the time I'm 20, George has landed in jail again for attacking me, and I'm divorced at last. So there I am, living in a one-bedroom, cockroach-infested apartment with two kids, and I'm on welfare, so I'm thinking, oh, what am I going to do? That's when I decide to join the army. in the military. A bitch, a hoe, or a dyke. You are a bitch if you won't sleep with them. A hoe if you got like one boyfriend and a dyke if they don't like you. So you can't win. In Iraq in the beginning I was considered a hoe because I was nice to people. <coughs> when I found out what people were saying about me I became a bitch. I wasn't mean but I just had to change so that nobody thought I was being flirty. I changed the way that I walked and the way that I talked. Everything. Nobody over there really knew who I was because I was always putting on an act. And a lot of the men didn't want us there. One guy told me that the only reason the military send female soldiers is to provide eye candy for the guys, to keep them sane. In Vietnam, they had prostitutes, but they don't have those in Iraq, so they have women soldiers instead. It was July 2003, by the time I got to Iraq. We were in Fobbs Fiker, which used to be an Iraqi air base, and there were huge pictures of Saddam Hussein everywhere. It was spooky. Soldiers would pose next to them and take pictures like tourists. I was attached to an army engineering unit, and our job was to build bases and roads and fix bridges. So we cleaned up the rubble and all kinds of disgusting stuff in the building <coughs> so we could move in. Excrement, rags, bits of military equipment. We prepared the base, built runways, used scrap metal to make our own armor because we had no up-armored vehicles. Uh, we built a basketball court for ourselves. but. We were doing nothing to help the Iraqi people. I was petroleum supply specialist. That means I pumped gas. My job was to drive around the base refueling dump trucks, rollers, scrapers, wait for a couple hours, then do it again. 
But when it was busy, it was really busy. And when it was slow, there was absolutely nothing to do. So I wrote a lot of letters, took pictures, threw rocks into a box. My unit was a real good old boys club, though. And I was one of only 19 women out of 141 people. The leadership didn't trust women to do a good job at anything. They were always hovering over you, waiting for you to screw up. Soon, you feel like you couldn't do anything right. And the guys had cases of porn, which they'd look at out in the open. They were always calling out things like, Hey, Peterford! I like your tits in that t-shirt. It happened so much, you got numb. Finally, after a couple of months, I started to go out on missions to rebuild schools. That was the best part of my time there. But then, I began to convoy to other bases. I was driving a 2300 gallon diesel truck, and because it was taking occasional gunfire, it could have burst into flames any moment. It was a bomb on wheels. The Iraqi people were pretty hostile to us by that time. When we went into a town, we were always looking at faces and hands, trying to guess their mood. If they're staring at you, not in fear, but because they hate you, well, you know you're not wanted. We were told the kids could be dangerous too, they could be a decoy or carrying a bomb, so if they run in front of the convoy, you're supposed to run them over. I'd been a daycare teacher before I got deployed, and one of the guys on my team who knew this about me said, Ed and I have been talking. If a kid came in front of the convoy, we don't know if you'd be able to run him over. I had to tell him, I don't know if I could either. But then, our first day out, a boy threw a rock at our vehicle. It made a crack, like a bullet. And I knew then that if I had to hit a kid and kill him, I would. Not to save my life, but to save all the soldiers who might die. That was really hard to come to terms with. You feel <clears throat> so dirty. By the time I was deployed to Iraq in 2005, I was 35 years old and I had been in the army for 14 years. So when I was on the plane to Kuwait and all the young soldiers around me were making all kinds of dumbass <laughs> jokes about going to Iraq, I gave them a piece of my mind. Hey, I don't know what this means to you. But to me, this isn't a game. I have four kids at home who will have no understanding if I'm killed. Back when I was training at Fort Bragg, <laughs> I knew things were going to get bad when I saw how my command was acting. Instead of the leadership saying we need to work together to bring these soldiers back safe and sound, too many people wanted to be chief and not enough wanted to do the work. And they were training us like we were going to fight in a jungle, not the desert. They made us practice lying in the grass when taking cover behind jungle plants. Shit, there ain't no jungle in Iraq. Then I had this dream. I'm in a truck and it gets hit. The vehicle blows up. And all I see is a big ball of fire above me. My sight goes black for a minute, and when it comes back, I'm descending from the clouds to my mom's house. My mom is there, and she is going berserk because the news has gotten to her that I got killed, and that's what hurt me the most. The next morning, they ordered me to the firing range to practice shooting with live rounds, but I couldn't shake that dream. I get my weapon, and when I look up, the first sergeant and the commander are there, and I'm thinking, these morons are going to get me killed. And all of a sudden, this anger just comes over me, and I can see myself shooting both those morons dead. Sir, I can't go to the range today. Somebody needs to take this weapon off of me, please. No, sir. And I throw my weapon and my Kevlar on the ground, and I walk off. And then I call my uncle, who's a bishop, and I tell him about my dream. And he says <coughs> it's a warning about my leaders being so weak. So I decide I've got to speak to them. So I go to the first sergeant. Sir, we've been here now for about four or five weeks, and for some reason the senior enlisted still have not gotten it together. Now, none of these soldiers are going to tell you this to your face, but I will. 
We don't believe that you are able to lead a horse to water. Well, he didn't like that. He slapped me with an Article 15 for attempting to destroy government property. That was for throwing my M16 and my helmet on the ground. And then he tried to send me for a mental eval. Sir, I've been in the Army 14 years, sir, and I have never been sent for a mental eval. Just talk to me, sir, when there's a problem. I know when I get tense, my, my brows kind of frown up, but it, it really doesn't mean anything. I'm not as fierce as I look. So I thought that was the end of that. Two weeks later, we were deployed. When we flew into Kuwait, there was nothing to do for six weeks. I had my 20th birthday there. Otherwise, we just sat around, played cards. And then finally, in June 03, we convoyed to Baghdad to Camp Mustang in the Green Zone. Our mission was to reinstall the police force, guard it from the looters, fix it up, weed out the good police from the bad. Some were taking bribes, raping, eating the prisoners. We weren't going to allow them to do that anymore. Some were part of the insurgency. We figured it out. Later, we were moved to this different base where we were sleeping in tents with sandbags around them. We didn't have any protection from mortar there. This tent just down the road from us got hit. It was shredded. My friend Sandra had just left a latrine when it got mortared. She turned around. It was gone. My first five months, the routine was the same every day. You get up, load the trucks with equipment, go through inspections, meet with the squad about where we're gonna go, and then I'd have breakfast and I'd come into a Humvee with the two guys that made up my team, and we'd convoy through Baghdad to a police station. Twelve hours later, the next squad comes, relieves you, you load up, go home, put everything away, go to sleep, and do it all over again the next day. Being the lowest ranking soldier in my team, I was the gunner. That meant that when we were driving, I was sticking out of the rooftop of the Humvee with my 50 cal machine gun in this little gun turret. Now in the turret, you're exposed from name tag up. We didn't have any shields. Luckily in the beginning, we mostly got good feedback and waves. We had like 20 little kids that were always following us and dancing for us. Some of the women did run away. And then later people got hostile. People stare at you, give you dirty looks. Give me the finger. Some tell you to go home or throw a rock at you. And guys expose themselves because you're female. Now, as a soldier, the hostility doesn't bother me. But as a woman, it bothers me a lot. I hate it when guys do that, Iraqi or not. I think it's sick and disgusting. And some of our own soldiers were a problem, too. They make flirty or sexual comments stare at you. That was the thing that I couldn't stand. You walk into the chow hall, there's a bunch of guys that just stop eating and stare at you. <laughs> Every time you bend over, somebody's going to say something. It got to the point with me where I was afraid of walking past certain people because I didn't want to hear their comments. It really wears you down. I said I loved my job. And I did, but right from my time at boot camp up until I got out, I was harassed all the time. People used to call me Air Force Barbie. I couldn't go anywhere without being watched by a million eyes. I had a senior non-commissioned officer constantly quiz me about my sex life, show up at my barracks at odd hours of the night, and ask me personal questions that no supervisor should ever have the right to ask. I had a colonel sexually harass me in ways I'm too embarrassed to explain. These are the people who had complete control over my life. When I worked, when I ate, when I slept, when I could talk or not talk, rest or not rest. These are the people who I was supposed to obey no matter what. One time my sergeant came sit with me in the chow hall and he said, I feel like I'm in a fishbowl the way all these men's eyes are boring into your back. That's what my life is like, I said. Well, finally I went to my leadership and explained the situation. I was told to write an MFR a memo for record, every time that officer said or did anything that made me feel uncomfortable. Well, I did that for months until I had a binder just full of those memos. I took it straight to senior leadership. Did 
that officer get punished? No. He went on to make E-9, which is the highest enlisted rank in the armed forces. Why am I complaining? It was only words and gestures, right? But it should never have happened. I was a hard worker who loved her service and country. This is not what I deserved. But like so many other females in the military, I put up with it for the good of my family, my beliefs, and my country. Well, after my first deployment, I decided the constant harassment was all just a part of being female in the military. And I made the decision not to tell anyone anymore about my problems. Excuse my language, but I decided to be a bitch. Bitch! bitch. When I first got to Iraq in November 2005, I was still hoping to do God's work among my fellow soldiers. I was there for a year, and in the beginning I was attached to a platoon out of Alaska. My company had 60 men and one lone female, me. I was also the youngest, still 17. Because I was the only female there, men would forget in front of me all the time and say these terrible derogatory things about women. I had to hear these things every day. I'd have to say, hey! And then they'd look at me all surprised and say, oh, we don't mean you. <laughs> <laughs> One of the guys I thought was my friend tried to rape me. Two of my sergeants wouldn't stop making passes at me. Everybody's supposed to have a battle buddy in the army. Females are supposed to have one to go to the latrines with or the showers. That's so they don't get raped by the men on their own side. But because I was the only female there, I didn't have a battle buddy. My battle buddy was my gun and my knife. When we drove up into Iraq on a convoy in April, we saw how the people were living. It was so sad. We saw kids on the sides of roads using hand signals to beg for food and water. I mean, kids barefoot and dirty. We saw how they live in makeshift mud houses held together with pieces of clothing or plastic. It, it makes us realize how blessed we are. Seeing those kids, though, made me miss my own kids real bad. Now, my youngest, he don't beat around the bush. On Mother's Day, he sent me an email that said, Mommy, love you. Happy Mother's Day. Wish you were here. Hope you don't get killed in Iraq. <laughs> okay, bye. We were based at Camp Adder in the south, but it wasn't long before they sent me on a convoy up to Camp Anaconda, which is 50 miles north of Baghdad. <laughs> Anaconda got mortared so much, the soldiers called it Mortaritaville. But our trucks had no armor, nothing, and we weren't even authorized to be out on that road. But they sent us on out anyway, and at night, too. <laughs> it was a suicide mission. I'm driving the middle gun truck when an IED goes off right under the truck in front of me. It was so loud it scared the living shit out of me. My heart was pumping so fast, felt like it was gonna jump right out of my chest. But I showed none of what I was feeling to my soldiers. Two days later, the commanders ordered us out into formation. I expected some kind of apology. But they were blabbering on about nothing. Setting up the internet, how we're violating dress codes by wearing the wrong t-shirts for PT. Dude, I've been fired. I don't want to hear about no goddamn t-shirt. Then they asked, anybody got anything to say? Nobody said anything. But these soldiers were young and trained not to question their seniors. So I raised my hand. First Sergeant, did y'all forget about the incident two days ago? Do you realize that none of your soldiers have any confidence in the leadership now? Don't you give a damn about us? First Sergeant gives me this look like he wants to kill me, but he don't say nothing. See, when you have a female with that type of attitude in the military, it does not go over well with a lot of men. I was deployed to Iraq in 2004 when I was 42 years old and a staff sergeant with 19 years of service under my belt. I was so proud of what I'd done in the military that when my two sons grew up, I encouraged them to join too. One's in the Army, the other's a Marine. 
And by the time I got sent to Iraq, they gave me seven grandchildren. I was based at Camp Cedar II, a convoy pit stop about 185 miles southeast of Baghdad. I was put to work with the lieutenant in charge of organizing the movement and repairs of all the vehicles. But they were so messed up, they didn't know how many soldiers they had. You could be missing for a week and nobody would know. So I thought, okay, they don't know what they're doing any better than I do. And I started organizing the whole thing myself. But we were under command of this female major, a white woman who hated anybody who wasn't white and male. She replaced every soldier of color with a white soldier. And she made the soldiers of color train the white people who would take over their jobs. She destroyed the careers of many soldiers of color doing that. But if you said anything, you'd be punished. One of the th first things she did when we got to Iraq was she made me and the other female non-commissioned officers move into the same tents as the privates. We literally had that much space between our bunks. Now, you do not move a higher ranking soldier in with a lower ranking. It makes you lose your power base because it's their territory. The major knew this. That's why she did it. Soon, the privates are refusing to obey our orders. This one girl, Benson, she had a canopy over her bed with pink blankets, and I thought, what the fuck? But when I tell her to move her bed over a foot to make room for me, she goes into this itty bitty little voice like a baby. I don't care what you say, I'm not moving, Sergeant Flores. But I got worried about what my young soldiers were going through out there on the roads in Iraq. One was this young female sergeant who trained as a driver, but they made her into a gunner because there was a shortage of military police to do the job. That's how a lot of women end up in combat in this war. Well, she and her team are out on the road one day, and they were attacked with mortars and grenades. So the sergeant fires back with her machine gun, and she kills a bunch of civilians. When she gets back, she's all excited and shouting about what happened. Calm it down. Right now your adrenaline's up. Tomorrow's going to be a different story. Then I realized the combat stress team hasn't shown up. Now they're supposed to come help soldiers have been in battle like this. But nobody bothered to come. Go to bed. It'll be fine. But I know it won't. Sure enough, the next morning, this sergeant and her team are a mess. One's lying in her bunk in a fetal position, and the others are sobbing because, well, they've killed all these innocent people. And Benson, the girl with the pink blankets, well, she was driving a large truck in a convoy. Now, over there, you drive on the opposite side of the road a lot to avoid IEDs, and you drive fast. Well, this car was coming towards her but nobody had time to get out of the way. So the car ends up driving right underneath the truck. Killed four children and both the parents. There was blood, body parts, all over the place. So when she gets back to camp, she's in shock. I guess she thought I was still mad at her because she just stood there and didn't say anything. So I hugged her. She started crying. She was only 20 years old. They should have debriefed these girls. They should have had a combat stress person there, but they didn't. Nobody was taking care of these kids. So you can imagine the condition they were in when they got back home. And I know it's not getting any better. In October 03, I was sent up to Bakuba, just northeast of Baghdad. We stayed in Camp Warhorse. One night, we were in the rec building. I was doing my email when the whole building shook. There was this high-pitched squealing sound and a flash, and it went black. Everybody stared at each other a second, then dropped to the ground! 20 seconds later, 
later, another bomb came in. I grabbed somebody's shirt. Take me to the bunker. We got outside. There was no bunker. Another mortar dropped 50 meters away. Shrapnel was flying over our heads. This girl was lying on the ground screaming. My phone's coming out of my arm. My phone's coming out of my arm. Someone inside the building was calling. Medic! Medic! I ran back inside. I saw four bodies on the ground, two Iraqi workers and two American soldiers. It was black in there, and all I had was this tiny blue flashlight to see. Blood was all over the place. This girl was lying on the ground, covered in it, and this guy called Sergeant Hill was helping her. I said, is this blood all hers? Is an artery hit? He said, no, I think some of it's mine. I got hit too, but she's worse. I found someone else to help her, and then I lifted his arm, and there was all this blood. He was much worse than her, but he didn't realize because he was in shock. We packed all the wounded into the Humvee. I was holding back this guy's blood with my hand. I didn't have anything else. Another mortar dropped. We had no flak jackets, no Kevlars, nothing. So we threw our bodies on top of the patients. The mortar stopped long enough for us to drive the wounded to the hospital. Soon as I got there, I saw a nurse and yelled, this is Sergeant Hill. He's 32, he's O positive, he needs blood now. How do you know? Because I'm covered in blood and none of it's mine. The only thing that helped me survive my time in Iraq was my boyfriend, Stephen. I could not have got through it without him. We met the night that I arrived at Fort Dix, New Jersey for my AIT. We started talking immediately. He said, give me your number. And then later he texted me saying, what's good? We started going out right away. Steven's black, but he looks kind of Dominican. Real cute. Six foot, big, muscular guy from New York. <laughs> now, you're not allowed to fraternize in the army, which means have a relationship, but everybody did. And because I was a specialist and he was a sergeant, nobody could know about us, but everybody knew. And then I got pregnant by him. So I couldn't deploy when he did and the rest of my team did. I had to stay behind at Fort Dix with strangers. And then, after three months, I had a miscarriage. It made me feel empty and sad. I really loved Stephen and, and I, I really wanted to have his baby. They gave me one month to recover, and then they said, you're going to Iraq, which it made me really mad because one month is not enough time to get over losing a baby. But in February 05, they sent me to Fob Spiker. Then they put me in this chew, which is um, a tiny trailer that sleeps two people, but you gotta share it with three. The night I arrived, it was so tight, I had to squeeze my way into it. I didn't end up getting along with the girl on my right. But the girl on my left, she was a friend from before. She was really excited to see me because the last she'd heard, I was pregnant. So the first thing I did was I put on my favorite perfume and I went to look for Steven. Now we hadn't seen each other for four months and he knew I was coming but he didn't know when. So I knocked on his door and his roomie said that he didn't know where he was. And then I remembered the time difference that when it was midnight for him it was three o'clock for me and that's when we would talk online. So I thought, I know where he is. So I ran over to the recreational building, and sure enough, there he was, sitting at a corner computer with his back to me. But I didn't go up to him right away. Instead, I sat at a computer and I logged online. And sure enough, there he was. So I wrote, I'm in Kuwait. It's really cool that I'm on your time zone. And then he wrote, it's weird. I can smell you. <laughs> I must really miss you because I can smell your perfume. So then I wrote, turn around. And he turned around and he just started laughing. In each police station that we fixed up in Baghdad, we'd go through the day searching people coming into the station and <coughs> searching guard positions. I searched mostly women. Guys were not allowed to do that in Iraq. Um, you go through the day standing or sitting, you'd be there for like 12 hours. It's hot. You can't move. And you have to watch everybody all the time. 
but you get used to that. The thing that I couldn't stand was the people that I was working with. My squad leader was a pervert. He was old, like 35 or 40. <laughs> he used to point out these little Iraqi girls and say disgusting sexual stuff about them all the time. These girls are like 12 or 13 years old. But the worst was my team leader. He made passes at me at first. He stopped. But then he tried to have revenge by controlling everything that I did. I had to eat with him. He wouldn't let me eat with my friends. I had to clean my weapon with him. He wouldn't let me talk to anybody. So I'd sit up in my Humvee turret all day long just to get away from him. Alone. Every day. And people knew it. They'd come up to me and say, Man, your life sucks! <laughs> <laughs> when I try to get switched, they wouldn't do it. And that really made me hate my time there. It got so that I didn't trust anybody in my company after a few months. I didn't trust anybody at all. <coughs> During my first few months in Iraq, my sergeant assaulted and harassed me so often I couldn't take it anymore. So I decided to report him. But when I turned him in... The one common factor in all these problems is you. Don't see this as a punishment, but we're going to have you transferred. Then that same sergeant got promoted right away. I didn't get my promotion for six months. They transferred me from Mosul to Rawa. Rawa was nothing but a tent camp on the Syrian border covered in sand. The camp had Marines, Navy, Air Force, and Army. There were over 1,500 men in the camp, and less than 18 women. So it wasn't any better than the first platoon I was in. I was fresh meat to the hungry men there. I was less scared of the mortar rounds that came in every day than I was of the men who shared my food. I would never drink late in the day, even though it was so hot, because the Porter Johns was so far away, it was dangerous, so i go for 16 hours in 140 degree heat and not drink. I just ate Skittles to keep my mouth from being too dry. I collapsed from dehydration so often I have IV track lines from all the times they had to rehydrate me. They made me cook because I was female, though I wanted to do other jobs too. So I was cooking 1,500 meals three times a day. I worked from four in the morning till nine at night the next day. I was exhausted all the time. One day, somebody wrote my name on a porter john, saying I'd had sex with a lot of people, only they put it in much worse words than that. But when I wasn't working, I went to chapel, and then I went to bed. That was all I did. Work, chapel, bed. Work, chapel, bed. It was so untrue, but I couldn't prove it. I couldn't defend myself. Nobody there wanted to believe me. Nobody was on my side. I'd always tried to stay cheerful, be nice to everyone. Back in boot camp, I was known as Sunshine. But within a few months, I went from cheerful and smiling to bursting into tears all the time. I couldn't even smile anymore. I called Mama, crying, and told her what they were doing to me. If you were treading the path of righteousness, none of this would be happening. When I was working the entrance of Spiker, I saw convoys being hit all the time. Highway 1 ran right past our base, and we'd call it the Highway of Death because so many people got killed there with IEDs and mortars. One night this convoy got hit, and it was like this huge flash in the night. And then they drove to us with their wounded. This civilian, he got out of his car and he started throwing up because his brother, who was sat next to him, had been shot in the throat. I was on a tank on the road, just looking at him. Oh, we radioed for an ambulance, but they have to go through all these clearance and shit, so by the time it arrived, it was too late. The guy was already dead. I never really thought that much about death when I was in Iraq. I figured 
everything happens for a reason. I'm going to die sometime, right? So I was never afraid of dying. What I was afraid of, though, was, was uh, losing a limb or scarring my face or tripping, because walking is really hard. You've you got all this heavy equipment, and it's hot, and the equipment weighs nearly half your weight if you're small like me. And I was worried about our equipment, too. We had these, these flat jackets from Vietnam, which everybody said were no good against AK-47s, which is what the Iraqis are shooting. Our radios were old and broken. Our ambulances rattled and shook I could not imagine traveling in one of those wounded. But I, I didn't mind working at the checkpoint. I got to work with Steven that way because he was the team leader. And the sunrises and sunsets were beautiful. And I got along with the guys on my team most of the time. There were a couple of things they did that bothered me. Um, Steven went home for two weeks on R&R. &R. And when he was gone, they hit on me all the time. And then we, when he got back, they made up all these stories about me, hoping that we'd break up and that they'd get a chance with me. Oh, and if we were attacked, they would make me stay right at the back of the tank. And they'd be like, no, it's because you're like a little sister. We don't want anything to happen to you. And I'd be like, no. Don't look at me like I'm your little sister. I'm a soldier, not a gender. I'm a soldier just like you. Well, then they took it to the next level. We had to guard out in the road. Nobody wants to guard out in the road. The soldier that's out in the road is known as the sacrifice soldier, because you're the first to be hit if anything happens. For a while, they, they put me out there every night. They didn't want to hear me say, I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier, just like you, and you, and you. My second deployment was to Afghanistan in 2006 with the Army 10th Mountain Division. Now by this time, I'm a sergeant with years of sexual harassment under my belt. <laughs> so I decided this time it was going to be different. This time I decided to put up a wall. Now my wall became thicker and thicker. You know, normally I'm a very bubbly person, but all that disappeared behind the wall, and to this day I don't know if I've ever regained that part of myself. But you have to put up a front and act like one of the boys, even if it means losing who you are. You become very cold. And you don't show your emotions. And you don't let anyone in because if you do, they will walk all over you. Still, harassment was worse than it had ever been. A few months into my deployment, I was directed to pull night guard duty. Now, I smoked like a chimney when I was in Afghanistan. And this night was no exception, so. After a few hours, I put my weapon and my radio in the guard shack and walked 20 feet to the close smoke deck. You don't ever leave your weapon unattended while you're in a combat zone. I had a momentary lapse. Thought I would be okay 20 feet from my weapon. I was wrong. I'd just taken a few drags of my cigarette when somebody grabbed me in a choke hold and dragged me behind some power generators. All I could see was a man much larger than me in a U.S. Armed Forces uniform. I struggled with all my strength to get free while he dragged me to the spot. I tried my hardest to fight him off, but it wasn't enough. He finished his deed. Well, I waited until my ship was over and then did what every law and order show says to. Do not take a shower and go straight to the authorities. I thought they would listen to me. I was wrong. They told me if I filed a claim that I've been raped, I'd also be charged with dereliction of duty for leaving my weapon unattended in the combat zone. That could get me court-martialed. Could end my career. So I shut up. Shut up!
It didn't say anything to anyone. Soon after I got to Iraq, they made me convoy commander. Now, some of those convoys are 25 trucks long. And I was in charge of making sure that every one of those soldiers and drivers did the mission and got back in one piece. One time, I'm in the lead gun truck going through a crowded street with this young guy up in the gunner chute. Now, he hasn't been out on the road before. He's been in the office doing paperwork for so long, he was getting called Professor Stapler. Now, we got traffic coming at us and civilians all over the place. And then this car comes toward us too close for comfort. But being that it's my gunner's first time, he doesn't know what to do. So I tell him, fire a warning shot. He doesn't shoot. So I tap him, hey man, don't be afraid to fucking shoot that weapon. You do know how to shoot, right? The vehicle is getting closer and closer, but the moron still doesn't shoot, so I hit him hard. Hey man, I tell you to fucking fire, you fucking fire, you hear me? You don't never let a vehicle get that close to my fucking convoy. He knows I'm not playing now. So he fires right at the car. The hood peels right up, the whole car goes womp, 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 rolls over on its side, and then tumbles over this bank. My gunner panics. I mean, he's only 19. He grabs his head and he yells, Oh my God, I think I killed somebody! <laughs> Look, it's not your fault. I don't think you shot nobody, but we still got a lot of shit coming at us, you hear me? So I need you to focus right now and pay attention. But his face is red and he's yelling, Oh my God! But when we get back, he has got a story to tell the guys. And it makes him feel like he has matured from a boy to a man. See, a lot of young soldiers feel that way. Women, too. They think, I am not some wimpy female because of the job I did in Iraq. The longer we were in Baghdad, the worse it got. It got so that you knew something was going to happen every day. You just didn't know what. One day we were driving to this police station in Najif when suddenly this IED pulled up right next to my Humvee truck. And I must have passed out because when I got up, I was by myself in the truck. Uh, my ears were ringing. My whole body hurt. They gave me first aid. Uh, an IV and some field dressing. I had shrapnel. That's little bits of metal in my arm and in my face. And my eardrums were ruptured. I went to the hospital and they cleaned me up. They gave me painkillers. Um, but I couldn't work for a month because I was deaf. So I just hung out on base. I watched a lot of movies, and I slept. My body hurt so bad. But I wasn't phased about being wounded like that. I was like, OK, I'm alive. In fact, I was kind of pissed that I didn't get hurt worse. I really hated it out there. My Shrapnel's still in there. <laughs> they only take it out if it's really big. Um, they took it out of my face. You can see the scars, but it's not hideous. My hearing's not so good as it used to be. My friend Michelle Whitmer, she was in our platoon. Um, she got hit too in an ambush. Uh, shot in the armpit. It hit her an artery. She was 20 years old. She died instantly. My tour in Iraq was a real eye-opener for me because my biggest enemy out there was my own company. Officers would brief us by saying, it's Indian country out there, go get them. I found that very shocking. If this was Indian country, perhaps I'm on the wrong side. But when I was over there, a lot of young people would come and ask me for help, especially soldiers of color, and I would stand up for them against their command. After all, I was old enough to be their mom. But that 
got me into lots of trouble with my command. I was banned from my own unit. I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone. And then they sent me to another base, Camp Scania. That's where they send soldiers to punish them, because Scania is on a major highway and gets mortar all the time. The whole time I was at Scania, I hardly ever wrote home, even to my sons. I didn't even think about home. It's because you become hollow, like a robot. You get up, you do your job, you hear people complain, you talk about this, you talk about that, but you don't look inside. My sister sent me a, a medicine box with my prayer stuff in it. So I'd sit at night, smoke a cigarette, and offer my prayers, and I watched the moon. That brought me some peace. That and, and the songs I would hear, the Iraqi men singing in the morning at Camp Scania, the prayer songs, the songs would echo and, oh my God, it was beautiful, like angels. I'd wake up peaceful because of those songs. I think they saved me from myself, because there are times I thought I was going insane. What the fuck am I doing here? Why am I not just getting on a plane and going home? What am I doing on this base? It's a concentration camp. That's when I started talking to the Iraqis who worked on the base. The young ones would come up to me and, and say, you're Indian from India? And I would say, no. And then finally one of them comes back after seeing the movie Dances with Wolves. And he goes, you're Red Indian. And I said, yes, I'm a Red Indian. And he goes, Native American. And I'm like, Yes. So I was invited to have a meal with them at the market they had just outside the base. They cooked the same kind of rice my people cook, the same kind of bread and chicken. I tell them, we make this kind of bread. Tell me about your people and your religion. I want to know about your women. I want to know what you think about this war. I found out so many of their traditions are the same as mine. The significance of the moon, our tobacco ceremonies, the way we use sage, and their clan system, how people marry in and out of clans, and their rules about paying things back. And I thought, what the hell am I doing here? Why am I doing this to these people? I started to see how we were changing the clan system, their council system that's been there for thousands of years. I started to see how imposing democracy means is not democracy anymore. And I began to think this war is a genocide. If it wasn't, we'd have things in place to help the women, to help the children, to help the civilians. But we don't care about them. We'd rather they die. Die!
down the days like most people did because you never knew if you were going to get extended and I didn't want to be disappointed but then the day finally came I was going home sitting on the plane next to Stephen I was so nervous I didn't know how my family was going to act or how I was going to cope with uh, going back to being a civilian I didn't know what was going to happen with Stephen either what every girl hates in the army is you meet a guy and you get close, but you never really know what kind of person he's going to be on the outside because people can present themselves however they want over there. I have this friend who was so in love with her boyfriend from Iraq that when they got home, she took a plane to go visit him and she waited at the airport for him to pick her up and he never came. When I got off the plane and I was walking through the airport, do you know there was nobody there saying welcome back or nothing? I was disappointed because you always see on the news when people come home, there's like fireworks and all this. Nope, nothing. Just me walking through the airport carrying my bags. I didn't even believe that I was back from Iraq until I saw my grandpa and my aunt. And my aunt gave me a hug. Now I never cry, ever. Only when Grammy died. But I cried. Because coming home is hard. It's, it's like you're a ghost. It's like you died and you're coming back to life. And you have to weasel your way back in because everyone has had to adjust without you. And I, I came back a completely different person. I'm not as easygoing, I don't like loud noise, I don't like being around a lot of people. And I lost how to dance. I think I'm so in tune with marching that I, I gotta be really drunk to dance. And I started getting really depressed. That's never happened to me before. I, I've always been able to deal with things, but I, I think it was Iraq and being in the army and Grammy and losing the baby, it just, it just all got too much. 
And it, you know, it made me really angry the way that I was being treated as a female veteran. We don't get the same respect as men. We have to really fight for it. I have stopped telling people about being shot at and seeing death because nobody believes me. Everyone just assumes that I did office work. I, um, I moved east to be with Stephen and to go to school and to get away from my family. And then I got pregnant by him again. He is a really sweet guy, but he's different than before. He's from the hood, so he has whoever he had before he had me. I don't know if he has them now. But he had to go back to his life, and I got to go back to mine, so I guess I'm having this baby by myself. <laughs> Whatever. Do you know, to this day, I've never spoken to my family about my time in Iraq. I mean, they ask me, but I just say, oh, it was hot. I don't want to tell them anything, because I, I don't want to feel sorry for myself. And the people that are close to you, they, they don't understand anyhow. And you can't hate them for not understanding. But a lot of the time, you do. If you asked the majority of soldiers, do you know what our purpose is in Iraq? They couldn't tell you. Some might give you some political bullshit to justify it, or say that because we wear the uniform, we're supposed to not speak bad about it, but most soldiers would say they don't see the point. If you think about this area here as the place the military built for us soldiers, you got Toilets and running water, showers, you got trailers, beds, mattresses, air conditioning, washers and dryers, you know, big generators running all night. You got Taco Bells, Subways, PXs, good food, lobster, shrimp, steak, and we're not paying the Iraqis any property taxes or anything at all for all our luxuries. But out here, on the outskirts, you've got Iraqi families living in huts. No electricity, no running water, who are starving. And you tell me when I go outside these gates and there's a kid on the side of the road asking for water, I'm not supposed to give him some? We've got warehouses full of water. But I can't give one bottle of this kid out of here who don't have any because we bomb the shit out of his water supply and everything else too? The U.S. government is going to stand for anyone coming in and telling us how to run things like that. But we think it's fine to go over there and westernize them. These people have been living this way for centuries. Now, I may not agree with their way, but that's their country. And who's to say that our way is the right way? You know what we are? We're just bullies. Bullies. That's what we are. When I got home from Iraq, I kept everything to myself. I thought I was going to be okay. I jumped straight back into school. I worked really hard. Um, but by a year later, I was tense all the time. I was snippy to my friends, hostile. <clears throat> Stopped hanging out. I did homework every night for hours. And I got jumpy. Loud noises bothered me, people walking behind me. I wasn't sleeping good either. I didn't get any help though. I thought my problem was hormones or something. Girl things. Maybe that's because those post-traumatic stress videos they show you never represent women. I don't act like a guy who has PTSD. I don't get into a car, drive 80 miles an hour, punch things! <laughs> okay. So, uh, I didn't even recognize that there was anything wrong until my boyfriend said, you should get some help. 
So I did. Some people ask me what the best part of being in the Army was for me. Is it this drive that I have to succeed now or all the friendships that I made? I can't think of a best part. Every day there was a bad day. By the time I got home in April 2004, after 11 months in Iraq, I was really a mess. I couldn't sleep for more than 50 minutes at a time. I'd be awake for two hours in between. I got angry easily, agitated. I had nightmares about the mortar attacks, flashbacks. On New Year's Eve, they had fireworks in our town square, and as soon as I heard the booms, I fell to my knees. Every time I opened my eyes, the faces in front of me would fade away, and I'd be brought to that night we were attacked. I was crying hysterically. My friends didn't know what to do, and I had nothing to talk about. All my friends' conversations were about movies <coughs> I hadn't seen or fashion I didn't know about. Anything I talked about turned morbid very quick. Little kids in Iraq, death, mortar attacks. And everyone would get quiet. No one would know what to say. I remember this girl talking about how she wanted some designer purse. And I said, yeah, I know what you mean. One time in Iraq, these kids wanted some food. And I felt really bad because we didn't have enough to give them. I hate it when you can't get what you want. <laughs> everyone just sat there. <laughs> they felt like assholes. <laughs> I felt like an asshole. I was so out of place after I got home, I, I couldn't feel comfortable in my skin, and I couldn't talk about it to anyone. I didn't know other vets were going through the same thing, so I thought I was crazy. My back and head were injured, too. I'm 80% disabled now because my back's so messed up from banging around in the Humvee, you no know, shock absorbers, hitting my head on the ceiling, compressing my spine. And I couldn't stop worrying about that guy in the mortar attack, Sergeant Hill, and whether he'd lost his arm and could I have done something more. I, I tried to get a medical discharge from the Army to pay for my benefits, but they made it so difficult I gave up. I couldn't get the tuition they promised me for a long time either. For a long time, I couldn't even get to a clinic for my medication or therapy because all the VA clinics were so far away. I work with veterans now, so I know a lot of soldiers go through this, which helps. It's important for vets to reach out to each other so you don't feel alone and crazy like I did. Um, I, I still think a lot about why we went to war. Was Saddam a bad person who needed to be removed from power? Yes. Uh, was he the reason for us going in there? Not really. And it's not the guys sitting in their conditioned offices at the Pentagon who are feeling the aftermath of it. It's the mother and father who are getting their child sent home in a box. It's the innocent people of Iraq who've been killed and raped and had their villages turned upside down. I really do love some of those people of Iraq, but well, I don't know how to help them. Some of those kids were so beautiful. They only wanted attention and food. Still, I knew if I had to kill a kid to save my buddies, I would. How can anybody love anyone who has such horrible thoughts? When I came home from Afghanistan, I didn't talk to anyone about the rape. Felt it was all my own fault. It took me six months to even tell my mother why I had to leave the Air Force. Well, I could never go back. Military has a way of making females believe they brought this upon themselves. Yes, I made some bad decisions, but the guilt lies with the predator, not me. There's an unwritten go to silence when it comes to sexual assault in the military, but if this happened to me and nobody knew about it, I just know what's happening to other females as well. 
It makes me so mad when I think about the fact that it let them get to me and left the military. I was so proud of being third generation. I had dreams of becoming a high-ranking officer one day like my father and my grandfather. Now, those dreams will never come true. By the time I came home, I felt like I messed everything up. I'd let my mom and dad down. I'd let everyone down. I hated myself. September 30th, 2006. That was the day it was going to end. No more shame would be brought to my family. It would be over. Take the tip of a blade to the middle of your forearm. Touch the top of the main vein. Press the home steel through your skin. Drag it down so there's no room for mistakes. One shot, one kill. That's what they teach in the army. See the thick blood running bright red? For a moment, it seemed that that gash would bring relief. I was ready to cut the other arm when the phone rang. It was Mama. She felt God pushing her to call. She wanted to tell me how proud of me she was. Iraq, I used to hold healing ceremonies for women. But when I got back home, I couldn't deal with those women anymore. To me, everything they talked about was petty. I didn't want to hear it. I lost connection with my mother, my brothers, my sons, my boyfriend, everybody. I came back so angry, and I didn't know why. Nobody could stand me. I couldn't stand myself. It's really hard to admit you have PTSD. It feels weak, because the military teaches you to suck it up and drive on. After I've been back a while, my former husband, George, died. He'd raped me and beaten me up, but I went to his funeral anyway. Maybe just to make sure he was dead. <laughs> but there was another part of me that cried. Not because he was my husband, but because he was a Vietnam vet who got lost. He didn't come back from war the same. He always talked about raping girls in Vietnam. So what he did to me wasn't any different from what he was used to. So whose fault is it? I don't know. But 
I don't think he was born that kind of person. I think the military made him like that. And I forgave him. After all, I have two sons from him. After I'd been home from Iraq for about half a year, I wouldn't even dress up, wouldn't wear makeup, didn't care. Couldn't concentrate, couldn't sleep, couldn't work. And I became paranoid, thinking people were following me and breaking into my house. And I was afraid to take sleeping pills because that would make me vulnerable if somebody attacked me. And I was broke. I joined the army to get off welfare. And after 22 years in the military, here I was on welfare again. I'm not the only soldier going through this. My friend who I'd served with in Iraq came home a year ago. They found her dead in her home. She'd been dead for two days. Had PTSD and depression so bad and she couldn't tell anybody because there was nobody to tell. So she killed herself. The war isn't over when you come home. One thing I really can't stand is for people to come and say, Thank, Thank you for your service. service. I hate that. Are you thanking me for participating in a genocide? Is that what you want? Because I am not protecting anybody's country. I am taking somebody's. Even though I never pulled the trigger, I feel that I participated in a genocide. I feel very responsible, and that's a hard thing to live with. Everything we've done in Iraq is a lie. And I feel very ashamed that I didn't see it sooner and stand up against it. I was a drill sergeant. My job was to teach other people's children how to kill. People ask me, how could I as a spiritual person teach people to kill? How, as a mother, could I send my own sons to war? I ask myself that. I bought into the whole thing. I <coughs> thought it was an honorable thing to do. I can only hope my ancestors will forgive me. Or that I'll be able to forgive myself. Myself. organization Liberty um, they're looking after our civil liberties please do look at the form and think about joining they have a great campaign on at the moment called military justice um, so in a moment when the chairs arrive
soldiers and the experiences they've had and Helen's done all the research in the States and Mark represents the British Army and we'll see uh, if there are any differences or how they feel. So I'm going to start off actually asking Mark, um, I'm going to follow the form of the format of the play which is why he <coughs> went into the army, if you'd like to expand on that Mark. Yeah, um, <coughs> I'm, I suppose, so just to give a bit of background, I'm, I'm 37 now. Um, I joined the army when I was 25. Um, I was served for six or well, six and a half years as a sister in the Coalition Guards. Um, it's very hard to really try and articulate as to why I actually joined the army. Um, I, sort of, I think it's like what it was for me. It was a childhood ambition or a childhood dream. I think like, a number of my friends when we were at school, um, they wanted to be train drivers or not train drivers. They wanted to be lawyers or they wanted to be other things like that. And for me, it was, it was always the army. Um, and whether that was because of the films I watched or the crowd I hung around with or whether it was because we used to go and hang out in the woods and play with sticks as machine guns. But there was a... There was a... There was a cool was it a sense of adventure that you felt that, you know, the, the adventurous or...? Yeah, I mean, to, to a point. I mean, I think I, think I, I think I ultimately saw it as the... Um, as the vehicle to fulfilling my life. Right, right. And... Um, um, would you like to expand on your experiences? The, the book is basically about uh, uh, Mark's experiences in Afghanistan. It's quite graphic. I actually have read the book, believe it or not, and it was quite interesting hearing so, because some of the things that he wrote about is mirrored in the play, and one of them uh, I'll mention is uh, uh, Maria Sanchez in the last part of the play, uh, when asked about, you know, how was it, she said it's rather hot. And when I was reading the book, this is exactly what Mark would say when he was on leave from Afghanistan. It's hot and the food's okay. And I found that really interesting that some of the comments that he wrote in his book about his time in Afghanistan mirrored what some of the girls said or how they dealt with what people asked. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. We just say as well that having watched the play, um, I came and saw it a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, the experiences and the feelings are very, very, very similar. Um, there's this sort of this suggestion or this possibility that there's a male-female divide, or that there's an American-UK thing. But the underlying factors that drive or deliver PTSD, are, I think, are very, very common to, to both. Um, I mean, for, my, for myself, um, in terms of war and what brought it on, um, I was blown up, shot up, had number of my soldiers under me die, um, killed people, fought in brutal hand-to-hand -hand, um, situations, um, and experienced, experienced what you can only describe as the, as the horrors of war. Um, and those things in themselves you know, are, are ultimately fundamentally terrible. But I think with the, the problem with the PTSD, um, the thing with the PTSD is very much the personal processing of it and the way that you deal with it as a, 
as an individual. Um, so when you look at the play and when people talk about the way they relate to their families, the feelings of responsibility, the you know, particularly as a soldier, the fact that you're afraid um, is something that really weighs very heavily on your on your mind. Um, and it's those very personal things that um, that lead you to where, or certainly led me to where I was in terms of PTSD. I mean, yes, they were caused by seeing some pretty, some pretty horrific things. Um, but I think I'm always very, very quick or very keen to point out that um, you know I was a soldier. I saw war. It provided me or made it got me PTSD. Um, but PTSD is something that anyone can can have can suffer from. Yeah, I thought one of the interesting points was that when Mark came back from um, Afghanistan, within he he went um, to see a medical officer after three weeks and uh, he explained that he couldn't get it out of his brain. And the chap just said to him, um, "Here's some sleeping tablets. You'll get over it." That's what everybody thinks about. And and he was dismissed. I mean, Mark's making very light of it, but uh, when he returned, um, his feelings uh, weren't really you know, addressed at all. Uh, what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to transfer over to Helen and um, find out about the research she did. She, she re researched over three years and uh, the men that you met in your research, if you'd like to yes, expand on that. Yes, sure. Uh, I, <clears throat> I think, Mark, your point of that there aren't really that many differences is really important and one I felt feel as well between uh, what men and women go through war and I very much wanted to write about what war does to people and that's more than the other things that came out about that are specific, more specific to women came out uh, as I was interviewing from the women. It's not, I did not go in looking for all the stories about harassment and sexual assault. I went in looking for what is it like to be a woman in combat because we don't, we haven't heard much about that. The Iraq war was, was a watershed for the number of women <coughs> um, who were at fighting in combat and getting wounded and killed. More women got wounded and killed and served in the Iraq war than all American wars put together since World War II. So I was very much looking at that. So I spent three years interviewing some 40 women who'd served in Iraq um, and some of them also in Afghanistan. And in doing so, of course, I came across a lot of men. I talked to their... Um, their partners who were in the military, I talked to their commanding officers, to their sergeants, to anyone I could find who'd served with them because I needed to corroborate their stories as much as I could. And I also got really good at spotting a, a soldier or a marine just about anywhere, so I began to kind of pick them up on the street <laughs> as it were, and we would just end up talking on trains, and it was quite striking. And um, and then as I began to talk and give lectures, more and more came up to me. And there were a few stories I'll tell that were very moving to me. One was a young Nicaraguan man who had joined the US military to get his citizenship. This is one of the things that President Bush promised, you know, that you could skip all of the difficult things and you would of getting citizenship and you wouldn't be deported if you, if you joined the military and went to Iraq. Um, and he came back and he said, uh, I left a wife and child and I came back incapable of being a husband or a father and I'm good for nothing but war and I, I just i am going to re-enlist and go back because I don't fit in here and I, I'm terrible for them. And by the way, they won't give me my citizenship. Um, <clears throat> that was very heartbreaking and I've heard it echoed a lot the difficulty of the kind of patience you need for everyday life to fit back in, the dullness of everyday life, the kind of patience you need to be around children in particular. It's very, very hard if you've been through war. Um, but I also heard an alarming number of stories about men being victimized by bullying and hazing in ways that often involve sexual assault. And I just read a report that came out from Human Rights Watch this very month um, that said the majority of men who are sexually assaulted in the military are done so in the context of hazing and bullying rather than being gotten drunk in a bar and then being assaulted or at a party of women. So 
very much with interesting. So there, I think there's a whole other level. When it comes to PTSD, there's not only a PTSD of trauma, but if you've been assaulted or you've been harassed or you've been bullied, to picked on and particularly targeted, that causes PTSD too. So these soldiers can come back with double, triple uh, layers of trauma to work out. Just to ask Mark, um, when you got the diagnosis of PTSD, how long did it take from the moment you, you felt the world was spiraling out of control? Having read his book, it, it's quite interesting that it took a while, the world spiraled, and there came a point where you looked for help. Yeah, I mean, the thing you, you said, I, I came back initially and I went to get to the doctor after about three weeks, I felt something was wrong. Um, and I was told, here's some sleeping pills and go and, you know, you'll be fine. And in their defence, there is, everyone who comes back from war will have a certain amount of trauma. Yeah. And some people, the, major, the majority of people will recover naturally. Now, that might take a long time, but they will come back down. And PTSD is when you, something's happened or for whatever reason that you need the assistance coming back. Um, but one of the problems that I had, and that was common to a lot of people, is once I was told that it was all okay, and I sort of made this, had this moment of mm. speaking to people, what you do then, and what people tend to do, is retreat within themselves. You become very isolated, yeah. and you're living a world, every waking minute, every sleeping hour, where you're reliving Afghanistan. For me, it was Afghanistan. And you just naturally assume that everyone else kind of knows that's what's going on and what's going on in your head because for you it's vivid, it's real, and you're there. Whereas quite often you're actually very, you're very isolated, you're very withdrawn mm. until you often have a few drinks and then it goes sort of, all out, it of goes control. out of control. I thought that there was an interesting point in your book that um, there were some young recruits that you were, uh, um, you were at the firing range, and when you heard the gunshots. Um, he went straight down, like Pablo made dog. He went straight down on the ground, and another chap did as well. And you just looked at each other, and you both recognised. Yeah, I, mean, I think stuff, stuff like that is fairly, is, is, yeah. is fairly common, and it's something we all recognise. I mean, I remember walking along with a mate of mine, he'd just come back from Iraq, and um, a, there was a delivery van, the, the doors at the door stand, and he found himself on the street, on lying on the floor on Oxford Street. It's just, become such an automatic up. response that even though you're back in civilian life, but, but if you hear a sound, yeah, and it's, you I mean, it's, react. It sounds, sounds of one thing for me. I mean, I, I, there was smells were a real, they're a real problem that we don't often talk about. Mm -hmm. um, I went for for a number of years. I said I was, I was blown up in a Land Rover, and there's a particular smell that you get when you're blown up in a Land Rover and sat in the sandy conditions, and it's 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 similar to the smell of bitumen or tar. And I, I spent a number of years. I couldn't walk past it. Roadworks. Um, without, without having that fight or flight thing kick in, without feeling physically sick, and without throwing myself back, you know, my mind straight away back in, in that in that moment. Yeah, I think that's reflected in the play. Anna Peterford, when she hears the fireworks on New Year's Eve, just collapses and hears all the the bombshells and like everything, and it, she's transported back into the, the world of war. Um, and the other thing um, I would like to ask you is. When did you, how did you get support? What, who, what helped you to pull yourself out of this sort of world of noise and I mean, destruction? Yeah, I was, I, was, I was very lucky and I mean, just to, just to come back to motivations and things, the British Army is very similar to the American. There's mm. people join for different reasons and dare I say it, a lot of officers join because they want to, a lot of soldiers join for other reasons, like they, it's a job, they might not have other, other options. Yeah. Um, I was very lucky, I had a strong family behind me, I had, I had a lot of friends, um, and quite frankly it was, it was their support, um, and not so much their support, but with their direct support, because yeah. a lot of the time they felt hopeless and didn't have a clue what the yeah. hell to do, but it was the fact that I had, and I knew that I had these people around me, and he loved me and wanted to look after me. Yeah, you had it scaffolding me around. I mean, in the, in, in the play, I'm just bringing it back to play, is Santiago Flores says her best, one of her friends ends up committing suicide. She felt terribly alone. She had nobody to talk to, and that was the end point for her. And one of the important things um, I 
gathered from the book is that if you have a support system, um, that it can help you to get onto the next stage. But yeah. you have to get there yourself. And you know, one of the things I think is great about the play, and one of the reasons I wrote the book that I wrote wasn't it wasn't about me, and it wasn't about necessarily the people who have PTSD. It was about people who the people who are around them, because the, far, the vast number of people who are affected by PTSD aren't the people who have PTSD, yeah. but their friends, their family, and everyone else who is there, who are the people who can actually make a difference. And certainly, the conversations I've had, particularly with my parents, um, since this has all happened, you know, you talk about me having a good, bad time, but I was in my own world. They just didn't know what the hell. They didn't know what the hell, yeah. the hell to do, and it was horrific for them. And my, on a completely different, different level. I wanted to ask you, Mark, if um, <clears throat> if there's a stigma uh, in the in the army to admitting that you have PTSD because it's it's a huge huge issue in the states. Um, yes, yeah, no, yes and no. So I mean, I remember the first time I remember after I got diagnosed with PTSD, and we were talking about it earlier, mm. and it was this wonderful moment of relief, but at the same because I had a label, I knew there was something wrong with me, but at the same time there was this crashing feeling like Jesus I'm, I'm, I'm mentally ill and yeah. what does this what does this this mean um, but I went back to my my job and I went to go and speak to my my bosses about it and very sheepishly sort of put my feet in and explained what happened and they they looked they weren't surprised you know this was we're in the army and they sort of you know this is what's been going on for forever mm. and the problem often lies not with the institution in these cases where there isn't actually a stigma about PTSD because it has been going on forever and perhaps the army does deal with it, although it deals with it often within its within its own confines. The problem is with the individual because where particularly in the army where you've got this very sort of machismo based sort of society where you're told you're strong, where everything is about you being um, you know, you looking after the bloke to your left, your bloke to your right, particularly if you're an officer you have responsibility. Um, so you actually admitting to yourself that there's something wrong is so, so against the, the whole ethos of the military culture that the stigma is actually something that um, you create your, yourself rather than what the army thinks about it. Because quite frankly, the army wants to help. Oh, well, <coughs> that certainly isn't always the case in the US. Oh, I mean, there, <laughs> there have it, been many, once, once many once reports. The help, once the help and manages the help and does the right, right thing, a very, very different thing. Right, but, right. Yeah. And, but the number of, of, um, of soldiers who never go seek help or who try to go and seek help because, and are shut off or mocked, they're mocked and turned away. Is it quite the... we, it, it, it's scandalous. I mean, this has been coming out now, but it's really been a huge issue, and it's one of the things that's, that's prevented people from getting the help. Can it may be the, most, the single biggest thing that's prevented people from getting help, along with what one of the soldiers mentioned, which is that because there's no national health system in the States, you have to depend on the Department of Veterans Affairs, and they are scattered through the country and they're not that uh, many of them so a lot of soldiers come from towns hundreds of miles away from the nearest hospital and, and the waiting lists make the national health look terrific. <laughs> See, there is a big difference there between the British and Americans, it's not necessarily yeah. in terms of sometimes the mentality but the, the size and the scale of what's, what's going on, yeah. the number of people in the, right. in the army, it makes and, it that in itself makes it a very, very different, or quite a different situation. Yeah. So I wanted to ask Helen, was it other soldiers, or was it sort of the people at the top? Where, where was the, yeah. uh, the sort of um, pushing back of the PTSD? Did they, did they feel they would be mocked by fellow soldiers, or was it they felt they couldn't go to? No, it, it was their commanders, it was the people right. they were going to who were supposed to be the vehicle to help, including sometimes military doctors themselves. But usually it would be their immediate sergeant or their immediate lieutenant they would go to depending on their rank. And, um, and those people were, have been, a lot of them were exposed as, as being just completely derogatory and mocking. Right. Um, but, uh, but then to bring it back to the sexual assault thing, and that's another thing, if you're a man and you've been sexually assaulted, um, the chances of you getting up the courage to 
reported are really, really tiny because then you will be mocked by everybody. And the women are already punished and mocked enough for it and blamed, but it's actually even worse for men because they're seen as the failure as a soldier if you can't fight off some pervert kind of thing. So um, <clears throat> it's, I just saw the statistics, I think it's something like 11% of men report it, whereas it's now about up to 24% of women report it. Can I just, just sorry. Just, sorry, just so with, with the PTSD thing as well, one of the, what there is a, one of the problems is that actually diagnosing PTSD yeah. is not a straightforward no. and easy, easy thing to do. Um, particularly, particularly it's hard to diagnose people who've got PTSD quite often because you know, you talk about anger and you talk about getting drunk and doing crazy things and these things do happen but a lot of the time people who've got PTSD are within themselves and are actually quite withdrawn from things and so are, and aren't bringing themselves forward mm. into, the, into a sort of an arena or under the sort of into the light where people can actually diagnose them and even then as you know, as you know it's, it's not a it's not a very straightforward diagnosis. Yeah. And that leads me to ask Helen, um, did you find there were differences between men and women? Because one of the, one of the characters in the play, Sylvia Gonzalez, says, I don't, I don't behave like a man who has PTSD. How did you find that in your research? I think uh, <clears throat> there's much more in common than there isn't. I was thinking about this all the way through the play, anticipating it. And, um, <clears throat> and I know that a lot, as Mark said, an awful lot of the things that the women say they feel and uh, are just as the same for men. Um, the withdrawal, the, um, the short tempers, um, the constantly being flown, you know, being, flying back into actually being in the war. I mean, all that is very similar. There are studies that show that women tend to be less violent outwards and more uh, self-destructive. Right. Um, nevertheless, uh, more men do commit suicide than women. So it's, it's complicated to sort it out. Plus, again, it does come back to sexual assault because a huge part of the PTSD is a combat compounded with, compounded with harassment and assault for women much more than it is for men. So, I mean, one in three women. So, um, and that's where, where the culture of blame makes you really withdraw into yourself and, uh, and not seek help. And just to cite another study, um, came out this month. If you report a rape, whether you're a man or a woman, or a sexual assault in the US military, you are 12 times more likely to be punished for it or to experience retaliation than the accused is likely to be investigated. Why? Wow. Because it's not a problem that the, well, why is that? I've read a whole book about that. How do I, how do I, because it, yeah, I don't know if Mark will agree with me on this, but the military is, a, um, <clears throat> is an insular world unto itself and very, very defensive of its reputation. Um, and because of the chain of command to the people who do the assaults of usually the superiors to the victims, and um, they are often the ones in charge of in deciding whether to investigate or prosecute. In fact, they always are. So they're being asked to investigate themselves, which is an obvious conflict of interest. And because of the old boys club mentality, women are seen as second class soldiers anyway. They're seen as traitors, they're seen as wimps, they're seen as failures as soldiers. If they've been assaulted, they're blamed for it. They're seen as bringing down the men. All the old rape myths come in and they mix with the culture of the military and its defensiveness, not wanting to know anybody to know it's dirty laundry and it ends up being a very, very oppressive atmosphere. That is a super shorthand answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think so. I'm just <coughs> sort of talking about my experience with the British, British Army. Yeah. I, I served with women throughout my time and I'd serve women in Afghanistan in the same situation that, mm -hmm. sort of where, where I was. Um, I think one thing I would say is that Afghan one thing that Afghanistan has, has done within the British Army, I think has made the position of women actually much more, um, I don't know if I say, I don't say tenable, but um, what it's done is it has, a, it has brought about what a lot of people consider to be a very open playing field where everyone has gone and done 
their thing. And you know, women women is the is the big thing at the moment in probably the British Army. You know, we had you go back at something every decade. So twenty years ago, we had an issue of race, um, and there was a lot of institutionalised racism. There's still some that exists, but you know, that's part of that's you can't. That's part of the reflection of culture as much as the wider culture as much as anything else. Ten years ago, it was about homosexuality and um, and about homosexuals in the army. And again, combat has helped move these move these things on within the military. And again, you know, you still have pe people come from somewhere before they join the army. And it's rather kind of sometimes amusing to still sort of talk about institutionalised racism, etc. Because actually, people have got a, an understanding or an idea of, of things like this and the bigotries before they actually come to it. And I think at the moment, there's, and there's been quite a lot of the press, that, um, particularly things have been said in. American press about front women on the front line and women, women in the infantry, um, and it's not perfect. It's not, but I think certainly you can speak for the British military, where post Afghanistan there is a shift, and it is born unfortunately of conflicts and com um, conflict and combat. I think in your book you mentioned a particular medical um, person who uh, was tough as nails and. That was uh, I just can't remember her name at the moment, but it really showed that there was total respect for this uh, female medic who, yeah. who was um, you know as tough as nails and could do the job <coughs> just okay, as well as now. Hold on. <laughs> no, no. What I'm trying to say um, is that there is, there is you know there is that understanding that, that women we are can't, in yeah, Of course, there. That's true. And you, let's not get carried away with generalisations mm. because of course there are individual women and most the majority of women are not uh, sexually assaulted and they are they have every in America they're allowed actually in combat um, that was lifted. There are of course women who are, who are respected but not enough the statistics show it and I believe they will show it in the British military too um, because it is a very as you said yourself it's extremely machismo world and um, it's there's been a long long history in the militaries of all the world of seeing women as booty and loot and not as fellow soldiers and um, and as objects of sexual objects of prayer um, and I think maybe, maybe I've had American soldiers tell me they think that the British military is more disciplined that, uh, and less chaotic than the American military and better run, and that might, that might help. But it would be, uh, I think it would be naive to say there isn't a it's, problem. I, I yeah, see, because I, we know there is, that we've already seen some evidence of it and it's coming out more and more. Yeah, no, I don't yeah. deny that. And so two points we've made, and one is that it was interesting when you talk about um, this sort of insular organisation which looks after itself and has a, it's naturally defensive and you know even talking now as a, somebody who was a soldier I have to be very careful about naturally falling back on defending the army and actually sometimes all the things I want to say are, are actually quite um, anti it but it's, it's something that's, but it is something that's there's, um, there's, there's the training works. Yeah. Your training works. You know, <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're, what, you're past, yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open up the debate because I think that you'd like to ask. Would anybody like to ask a question? Yes, please. I'm just really like uh, since there's obviously like a history of known of post-traumatic stress disorder and um, yeah, just just the general like post-war psychosis. And, um, mental health issues of all kind of degrees that come out of that. Um, how is it that there's like not more like just uh, training and awareness given to the soldiers as like part of their work going into that so they're aware of it coming out and they're um, having like even within the military like um, uh, support for soldiers like um, leaving and going back home to say like this is a good doctor you can go and talk to if you feel you've got that's a really good question. Would you like to answer? Please? There, there are concerned? some. I mean, there are uh, processing and there's debriefing and there. When you first come back in the U.S. military, you spend some time um, in a kind of compound before you're released and allowed to go home, where you're you, you're examined by a psychologist. You you answer questionnaires and you're given lectures about don't beat up your wife and things. And you know, and they and the, but. Most soldiers I've talked to find it all a bit laughable because it's very um, formulaic. 
um, and and they do push a lot of pills. They really push a lot of pills, both at or and afterwards. Um, but it's not as if they're not acknowledging that there are these that, that there's an aftermath of war that they're in there, that there's soldiers half and shell shock as it used to be called. Um, <clears throat> so there is some. The question is how effective it is. Mark? Yeah. Sorry, do a couple of couple of couple of um, things things about that. Um, I suppose you know, I'll come back to the it's been going on for mm. forever in a minute because I can you know, I've got some interesting experiences from my own family, my grandparents in, in particular. Absolutely, your grandfather. Um, things I learned when it was discovered that I had I had PTSD about my grandfather's return from, from the war, um, that it wasn't a new thing. Um, the way that the military deals with things, and again, I can only talk about my own experiences in the, in the British Army. And what I've seen is that over the past probably about 10 years, the way the British Army deals with things has improved, improved vastly. It's, n it's not perfect. They lose, and again, I sh should add that I currently work for a, I work with a charity at the moment, and we look after, in fact, we take injured veterans, a lot of them with PTSD, to do archaeology. Um, and one of the biggest problems that we know that is faced is losing people in the system. Um, because if somebody leaves the army, you know, the military has a duty of care up until the point that somebody leaves, and then they hand them over to the NHS. But a lot of these people slip between these, slip between these lines. There's a lot of charities out there. And, you know, things like Help for Heroes now these days, you know, they get a lot of good press. Combat stress. Yeah, I mean, they, they do some yeah. really good stuff, but they, they kind of, they, one time they, they get a lot of, they get a lot of um, good press being this new thing that's been going on. But military charities have been going on since you know big things since Napoleonic times, and it's the way we've always traditionally dealt dealt with something, and it almost has to be in some respects because if you look at what the military is in terms of the greater politics and economics, it's there to fight wars. That's what it's there to do. It has a budget, and that budget is goes towards buying bullets. I hate to say it, and it goes towards killing people for people's people's defence. Um, it's not there as a support mechanism or as a mental health organisation. That's why you have things like things like the NH, the NHS. But as I said, the problem there is a disconnect somewhere in the middle there, and it's very easy for people to slip slip through. And it's 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 not a not a good thing. Uh, if you just one, uh, would you like to say um, about your grand grandmother what she said to you? Uh, so some of the best advice, Mark. Um, had was from his grandmother. Would you like to explain? Yeah. So um, my, when I when I, when I had Peter, my my grandfather passed away, um, and I mean, I suppose I, I remember quite vividly him him dying, um, and there was all sorts of stuff going on around me with family and people in tears and stuff, and I was sat there playing on the computer game. Um, just totally disconnected, um, but it, it's something that's taken me a long, long time to, to deal with. But I think the point you were making was we were at my grandfather's grandfather's funeral, and I'd been back from war for about two years by then. And my parents um, had made an active decision not to include my grandparents in what was going on with me because they didn't know how to deal with it, they didn't want to worry anyone else. And I was never stood outside having a cigarette, having spent the funeral with everyone else in tears and myself sort of fairly rigid and not really dealing with anything. And I was talking to my grandmother and um, I sort of said, you know, Grant, she said, are you all right? And I said, you know, I think I, I've got PTSD. And um, yeah, she said, well, of course you do, you've been to war. Um, and I said, pardon? And she said, well, of course you do. You know, your grandfather had PTSD. They all had it when they came here. We saw, we saw a, a generation of men come home and we saw, saw what happened. And there was a sort of light bulb moment, a huge amount of relief, and so we realised that there were all these people out there who'd had this experience from both sides. And her advice was, she said, you know, you've, what are you doing? You've got this, all this medical support, all this support from the family and doctors and things. Just go and use it. Go and get involved because your your grandfather didn't didn't have any of didn't have any of that. Yeah, I would like to say I think one of the things I found most heartbreaking in my research is that I found these two two studies of the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marines that showed that half the enlisted men 
um, had been physically abused as children, and half the enlisted women had been sexually abused, and many had both. So that means that about you know that half the enlisted, that means you know below the officer ranks, um, had joined the military at least in part to get away from violent, dysfunctional homes, and maybe to feel stronger themselves, so they wouldn't go through life feeling like victims. But it meant that when they came out with PTSD. They did not have supportive families <coughs> to go back to. And when you look at the high population of homeless veterans, that is often the story behind it. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's two interesting points there. One is the predisposition to PTSD and about the environment yeah. you're brought up in and the way and yeah. how you feel about yourself and, all, and the mental state you're in before you go yeah. to war and about war actually being a catalyst as opposed to necessarily um, an, an effect. Mm. Um, and then the other one is yes, you know, you're right. We take the British Army again doesn't like to talk about it um, because it's not good for recruiting and things. But if you look, at, if you're open and honest about it, and you look at where the army recruits from, it's not necessarily it's not from the middle classes, it's not from the educated, it's largely from people who don't have another choice. And if they don't have another choice, there's probably reasons for it because of how they've grown up, because of the support they've had, and because of all those things. So you're already starting off with a, a group of people who are more likely to have had experiences that predispose them to PTSD. Um, or to, uh, then you have this ironic sort of situation about where military training is actually very good at, well, effectively I was promoting PTSD, because what you really want to do in terms of PTSD and avoiding it, um, you know, apart from, let's say, do a lot of yoga and a lot of meditation. Um, but you want to be able to deal, pro deal with your emotions and process them. And sort of come in, you accept them, you, do, you, you, know, you, you understand them, they, they, they go along. What the military teaches you to do is, under extreme circumstances, to be a non-human being, to carry on with your job, not deal with the emotions, not deal with the extreme situations. Mm -hmm. They bottle up, they bottle up, and then they, and then they blow. Yeah, that's why my, <clears throat> I heard several soldiers say to me that they dismantle the civilian and build up the soldier instead. But the trouble is, when you when you come home, they don't dismantle the soldier and build the civilian up. You're just left. On. But there's something else I want to bring up about PTSD, which I think may be the most difficult to talk about cause of it and the one that I find perhaps at least among the Americans I interviewed the biggest which is remorse and self-loathing especially those who fought in Iraq um, <clears throat> because there's so many questions about whether that war could be ju justified in any way and, then, and after the, it was discovered there were no weapons of mass destruction a lot the morale went very low um, and I think that that is actually, and that was expressed very much as you saw in the play by several of the characters, I think that's a huge, huge burden to get over. And it's a very heartbreaking one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's um, in Afghanistan as well, there, there are definitely problems associated with the issue of dealing with it. And if there isn't a, a rationale, if there isn't, if you can't, understand that yourself and you can't rationalise it yourself, you can't explain it yourself, then um, it becomes very complicated. I'm going to just take one more question from the... I've got so many questions, I'll just take this first lady over here, sorry. Um, institutional behaviour is what you were raising and you just said the question why, you just think, well how far can we go back, why, is, why are things the way they are still, even today? and looking at the difference between the UK and the US is actually really interesting. One institution that I personally know very well is the NHS, and the NHS has done loads to um, help with the whistleblower situation that they were fighting in the 80s, where people were silenced far too much, and then in the 90s they got more you know, doing positive things, positive work, and then now a lot of transparency and using the digital day that we've got to have more transparency, just let people have more of a voice. And do you, uh, you know, I mean, I think the US is good at looking at the UK and how they are changing things in the right, about bringing more women into 
the army and actually giving them more of a voice, but do you see a way of data, digital, you know, the digital <laughs> use of technology to be able to help slowly change the institution, especially in the US? Um, I think that probably, well, one thing, <coughs> so veterans and soldiers and veterans in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the current ones, have probably told more about their experiences and recorded their spirit experiences because of blogging, because of email, because of little cameras everybody has, because of iPhones, than in any other war before in history. Uh, there's so much documentation out there in the ether, you know, I mean, I was able to watch thousands of YouTube videos taken by the soldiers themselves in the middle of battle or goofing around on the base or raping someone or they just record everything, you know. So um, uh, that, and that has also enabled more whistleblowing, more talk, more overt talk. There are lots of Facebook book groups of, of the, have formed that I belong to, of women, military, that are closed but for each other, of women, military veterans, maybe who've been through something specific and need to reach out to each other. So all of that, I think, is made much easier online. Um, but it doesn't, well, obviously, the discussion is much more open now than it's been before. Uh, and that's been a combination of, you know, journalists like me, of films coming out and of people speaking out sometimes, you know, in, in person and some, sometimes online in one way or the other where they can hide a bit more. So I suppose, yes, there's some hope with that. Well, I'd just like to say the play, because it, the play has allowed the voice, uh, you know, these women to be heard to a lot more people, um, you know, by reaching out so that the discussion continues on. Can I just no, take one, no. sorry, can I, just, can I say that the technology is great and the possibilities are fantastic because there's a sort of simple equation with this that it is good to talk about it. Um, and it's great because it helps the individuals, it also helps, it helps everyone understand. But that needs to be, there, there are ways that you can do that. There are good things, there are bad things, you know, I look at my own treatment and therapy I went to, and there were things that worked one day that didn't work, or one others. There are things that worked for me that didn't work for people, other people. And it's not necessarily about controlling it, and but it is about it is about managing it. So yes, these things are wonderful, wonderful tools, but they need to be understood and used in the in the wider context and made made the most of. Okay. Um, on that note, I'm going to uh, take one more question, and that will be it. I'll ask you. Uh, it's about the play. Um, did you go when you were writing it? Did you go straight to the monologue form, or did you experiment with other forms first? And other um, stories. The play is the third form in which I've written about this material. So I've got a non-fiction book, which is a narrative non-fiction book. It means it's not just the interviews directly from. From here. It's not just transcribed interviews. I tell the stories through the soldiers' interview and give historical background, factual background, things like that. Then I wrote a novel called Sam Queen, which happens to be out there on the table. And I did that because briefly I felt that there were times when I was interviewing soldiers where um, they couldn't talk anymore. The memories were too painful or, or they didn't, or the memories had gone black, or um, they started having panic attacks, literally couldn't breathe, or they wouldn't tell me. Um, people had their barriers, and I was not going to re-traumatize them and push them and exploit them beyond where they were willing to go. But I came to feel that it was in those moments of silence that the real story of what war does to your soul and your individual soul and heart lay. So, lies. So, I, I, that's the territory of fiction. So, with Sam, and also it allowed me to delve into the Iraqi side too. So, the novel goes back and forth between an Iraqi character and an American character. Um, but I had all these transcriptions, and the soldiers were telling really good stories. They were telling them really well, I mean, they were very articulate. 
and, the, and they were also being so politically honest. And at the time when I was gathering these things, in America it was much more unusual to be that critical of the war, that especially as a veteran of the war. So the, these women were showing enormous courage, and I wanted to honor that by putting it together without my, my voice anywhere in it, except that I just shaped it. But it's all absolutely in their words, and we've all been very religious about honoring that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask Mark, well, after the PTSD, you know, what's the future? Do you want to tell people? Yeah, um, so, God. Um, What's the future? I mean, it's just, you know, so, it turns on a positive yeah. note. Yeah, life is For odd. somebody who's gone through a war, survived, you know, had a diagnosis, mm -hmm. and, you know, has come through the other end, it's really important to, to um, maybe get an insight in. Yeah, so I left the army in 2010 and um, set up a yoga studio. Um, which uh, is what you do. So we, myself and a, my business partner opened up the first yoga studio in the city of London thinking that busy professionals needed um, yoga. I was doing a lot of yoga and meditation at the time, which was great. Um, if anyone ever has PTSD or knows anyone that does have PTSD, suggest, it, suggest you sort of gently coerce them away from ever running their own business. Because it, <laughs> it, is, not, it is not good for your own if you're stressed. Um, since, so we've been through that and done that and now I work for a charity called Waterloo Uncovered. Um, and one, I was an archaeologist at university and I got drawn back into archaeology and what we've found is that archaeology is a fantastic um, means to help veterans with their recovery and this whole sort of issue of integration back into normal life, civilian life, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we we just come back from, from Waterloo, we're focusing on Waterloo because it's a bicentenary um, and we've just spent a good couple of weeks out there um, taking some soldiers out there to go and do proper, very highly professional archaeology um, but also putting them in a situation where it's nice and relaxed, they're doing good, hard physical work and that they're learning and they're learning through not being taught, they're learning through, through doing and they're mixing with Mixing with civilians, which is something they don't, they don't often get a chance to do. Um, and archaeologists on a whole are quite relaxed and like a beer after work, and um, it's a nice environment for people to, people to experience. On that positive note, I'm going to thank, um, uh, thank Helen Benedict, uh, the playwright, and it's been a real privilege to direct the play. Um, I'd like to thank her, and I'd like to thank Mark Evans for coming, and coming at the last moment. We, we had an original speaker who had to, unfortunately, due to family circumstances, not come. So I really appreciate you uh, pitching up. I'd like to thank all the actors over there who've done a marvellous job, our technicians, and I'd like to thank all of you uh, for supporting the play. Uh, it's not an easy subject. Thank you all so much um, for coming. Thank you.